sponsors. So this would obviously not help. Not, we wouldn't be able to do this if we didn't have our sponsors. So I'd like to thank our College Central uh, Network, along with Mountain Sack and Live and Jackie Kennedy Harris and Zero Six Media. Uh, thank you for you know helping in this event. And some of these sponsors that we've had have obviously done it over a period of time in many years. So we appreciate your partnership. It. Uh, so I want to introduce myself. I know we did it early this morning, but I'm going to repeat myself again. I've been uh, director of HR for about 25 years. I have a lot of experience in HR and I, you know, I work in different sectors. I worked in manufacturing, I work in aerospace and packaging, and I am delighted to be able to be here and participate and give the opportunity to uh, these five fabulous colleagues or mine that we've done several things over the years. I've known them for a long time and you know they're, they're my inspiration and obviously I admire them for the type of work that they do. Each individual will give you an opportunity to, you know, will give their opportunity to discuss about their industry, what they do and all that good stuff. So let me start by introducing um, the panel. So I'm gonna start with Yesenia. Yesenia is the president and CEO of HRY Personal Services. Uh, Yesenia has a BA degree in business administration, emphasizing management and human resources and attend the University of Laverne uh, for about a, half, uh, a year and a half towards her master's degree in leadership and management. She has over 20 years of experience in human resources field and own and operated her own HR consulting firm since 2008. Uh, next, we have Jessica Carrillo. She's the director of human resources. She works for Semco Steel. Jessica started Semco in February of 2017 as a senior HR generalist at a corporate office with a bachelor's degree in sociology from California, uh, Cal Poly University in Pomona. And later on, she got a master's degree in business administration from the University of Redlands. Prior to joining Semco, Jessica had human resources and operations roles in aerospace, food manufacturing, mortgage lending, and education industries. On April 4th of this year, Jessica has promote, was promoted to Director of Human Resources. Uh, next, we have Roxana. Roxana is the founder and CEO of Driven Talent. R Roxana is known for her fierce commitment to providing outstanding customer service and her tenacious pursuit of excellence. Her experience includes over 20 years of staffing, as well as extensive experience in HR strategy, people functions, operation, leadership development, and training. In recent years, Rosanna has consulted for various operations and staffing clients to aid them in growing their business, optimizing operations, and driving profitability. Roxana has worked with Fortune 500 clients in a human resources capacity, in the beauty, wellness, fitness, fashion, e-commerce, manufacturing, and transportation industry. With the latest growing e-commerce company from Los Angeles, Fat Fit Fun, uh, Oakley, United National Foods, Sun Sports, 3PL Logistics, and more. My next one is Perla. Perla is the Director of Human Resources from Lanky Tire Recycling Company, a human resources professional with over 20 years of successful experience in human resources management. In her current role as the West Region Corporate Director of HR, that's a very long title, <laughs> uh, Perla is responsible for supporting the organization across multiple regions. She provides leadership and development and, ex and executing HR strategies and support for the overall business in the integration of future employee groups related to our growing organic growth and acquisitions. She currently leads the team of HR professionals responsible for supporting over 400 employees. For um, Jaime Rodriguez, he's the Vice President of Human Resources for Hitchcock Automotive Group. Over 24 years of human resources experience responsible for planning, directing, and coordinating human resources management activities for a large privately owned company auto, automotive group, maximizing the strategic use of human resources and maintaining functions such as employee compensation, recruitment, training, personal policies, employee benefits, and regulatory compliance. 
So welcome all of you. I am so excited that you're here. Just going over your, your, your introductions, I realized that we probably have over 120 years worth of experience with us today. So I'm very, very excited for that. Um, you know, very, very proud that you guys are here. Um, you know, one of our, the main things that we want to accomplish uh, with this panel is to re really talk about what's happening, what's happening in the HR world and specifically interviewing, hiring practices and, you know, what are the things that HR needs and what are the th things that are, are happening out there that inquiring minds want to know. So thank you for that. Um, the way we're going to do this, I, I have specific questions that I want to ask depending on your industry. So I'll go ahead, call in your name and ask the, the first question. Um, and we have about, I don't know, 45 minutes to talk and discuss. We're going to leave about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for questionings after the fact. Um, and, you know, we can answer some of the questions. I really encourage everyone out there to be, to just ask tons of questions. These are people that have been in the business for a long time. They have, you know, ex a, a bunch of experience in, in various industries. So please feel free to um, just put your, your questions on the chat and then we'll be able to answer afterwards, okay? Let's start with Yesenia. Uh, Yesenia, with the changing times, what kinds of new positions do you see becoming available in the future? Well, in the future, in the last year, I would say uh, customer service positions, IT for sure, communications, recruitment, marketing. Bottom line is a lot of these office positions that required someone to be in the office every day are now allowing employees to work from home. Uh, I think the biggest thing to remember here is computer knowledge. That's a must. You have to know how to use a computer, how to maneuver yourself around the different systems. Uh, and that's what's going to keep you in a job. Because if you don't have that, it doesn't matter what the industry is, you're not going to make it. But that's what I've noticed, uh, those positions so far, but I'm sure there's a tons more. But like I said, the biggest thing is have that computer knowledge. If you don't have it yet, make sure you get it um know how to use different resources i mean for me i was doing this before the pandemic and i'm doing it more now uh training you know via uh zoom uh talking with employees almost anything we do nowadays you can do from home so uh when you asked about the titles i just thought wow that can pretty much be any title the positions mm -hmm. that cannot work from home, I think, are more of the labor, you know, assembly, uh, packaging, those you have to be in a warehouse or at a site. But if you're in an office, a lot of those positions can now be um, um, from home, off site, anywhere, anywhere in the country. Yeah, exactly. Definitely technology is taking over. Mm -hmm. uh, Roxana, what new and innovative hiring practices will your company utilize in the next few years? What do you see happening? Well, definitely finding best candidates has never been, I mean, it hasn't been easier at all now, a days, right? Everybody's struggling to find candidates. So I feel like in our uh, industry, it's very important that we invest in technology, uh, upgrade our processes from the hiring processes. We don't do any more applications and paper. Now everything is online, utilizing social media, utilizing the technology. So right now we're gonna really invest on in our company to make sure that we have the virtual reality videos um, in, in our platform. So candidates, when they come and apply, they really understand what their roles are gonna, are gonna be, how they're gonna look like, how they're gonna feel if they go and apply for this particular company. So we really wanna partner with those small organizations that, they don't have the idea or the guidance on how to get that, you know, going. Um, constantly partnering uh, with our new tools and use marketing um, for social media. So we can really have the communication and the engagement with the applicants in different ways and different ways of um, applying, like going to indeed Facebook, utilizing social media is gonna be now the key. So investing on the social media, and, uh, and platforms for marketing um, to make sure that, you know, we, we um, our new population really understands the, the difference on um, how it was the past now, what is now. Do you see a lot of people utilizing cell phones as well? Yes, um, I mean, everybody now, even ourselves, we provide the applications through online. They had to go to our website 
And if they don't have a cell phone with them, we're gonna have to give them an iPad. So what we're noticing right now for our people who have been working for many, many years in one particular job, and they're not looking right now to, they're looking now to change a job. They need to be updated on how to apply online. You either utilizing their cell phones or utilizing an iPad. So helping the community or the applicants to like really update themselves on how to do the basic as filling out an application online or using the technology, it's a key right now. Um, and we are gonna be investing a lot of time in, in, in creating processes to so we can educate this population so we can get them to the next level because that's where it is now. Um, everything is technology. Mm -hmm. Very good. Perla, I know you work, you obviously work in the waste management and recycling industry. So what resources do you use to develop the pool of qualified candidates in your industry? Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you guys. Uh, so as just as, um, you know, the other members have mentioned within HR it has gotten very, very difficult, you know, to recruit and retain the talent. In our industry, we do hire, uh, you know, most of our uh, employees are blue collar employees. So I can definitely feel the pain of, you know, them not being able to fill out an application. Uh, we do have an iPad for them, but even then we still have to sit by them to have them complete the application. Uh, we do use our company website, we use Indeed. Uh, we also just recently began using the SAP program for our driver positions. So the SAP program is a new uh, DOT, Department of Transportation, through Clearinghouse. Uh, and the Clearinghouse is really known for effectively removing drivers from the road for various reasons. So SAP program is, um, it stands for Substance Abuse Professionals. And so the program takes those individuals who have completed the DOT requirements to get them back to work and puts them back on the road. So I, I think that this is an amazing program. This recently just started. So it did become um, a hindrance for us in trying to hire our driver positions. So partnering with the uh, a consultant that is really amazing, utilizing social media, utilizing YouTube, um, utilizing TikTok um, has been very, very beneficial for us. Very good, thank you for that. Um, next question is for Jessica. Finding skilled labor in manufacturing and supply chain has been a challenge for many years. What resources do you use to find people that you need? Have your requirements changed? Uh, so we, we do use traditional sor uh, sources, uh, such as employee referrals, walk-ins from our now hiring posters. Uh, we also use agencies or candidates from agencies and applicants from our careers page and job fairs. Um, additionally, additionally, we use uh, staple job sites, such as Indeed, um, LinkedIn, ZipRecruiter, Monster, et cetera. And in most recent years, as some of the colleagues have mentioned, the adoption of social media and utilizing those platforms has been taking shape in promoting and providing potential candidates for our um, industry. Well, as for non-traditional resources, we have partnered with the agencies that specialize in job placements for newly retired and former military staff, as well as programs such as the Los Angeles uh, Mission to provide opportunities for graduates and these are individuals who have completed their rehabilitation program and are ready to get back into the workforce. Uh, fortunately for us, a lot of our positions are entry level, so we do not require any prior experience or a particular set of skills, other than, other than the desire to learn a new trade, and thus our requirements have not changed. Uh, looking forward to the future, we are partnering with our local high schools, adult education and trade schools to promote uh, our industry, manufacturing, as a workplace of a viable career option with growth path and um, stable working conditions. Very good, thank you. Yeah, I think it's very, very important to look at the resources that the different agencies and the county provide to be able to find those, those candidates as well. Um, Jaime, when looking at hiring requirements, how important is the educational degree as opposed to the technical skill set experience? I, I think that's a, a big question lately. Um, so I want you to address that for us, please. Yes, uh, first of all, hello and thanks for the invite here. I'm glad to be here this time and to be a, 
the proud only boy here actually representing. That's good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's kind of a long answer question. Uh, given the circumstances, given these crazy times, post pandemic, middle pandemic, whatever we can, we can call it at this point. But uh, a lot of employers are probably just, I mean, I just driving through the neighborhood here, city of industry, I, I, I see multiple signs for every single company just trying to bring warm bodies, right? I mean, at least someone to be there. Uh, so <clears throat> I think uh, it, it is, as I said, a long answer, uh, particularly in our industry, the automotive industry. That will depend. I think it will depend. The level of education, uh, at least uh, to some degree, is important. Uh, but it depends on basically, you know, it could be the position uh, and the industry, obviously. In our industry, I, I can tell you that I have had and have some of them, I have some MBA guys, you know, but I mean, we have MBAs who are willing and they're well fitted to work probably at anywhere. But they choose to be salesmen, you know, and sell cars just because of the money, because the money is there, especially in our times. And, uh, you know, you ask the questions. I mean, you have an, an MBA and I have an MBA guy who has an MBA from uh, Berkeley, you know, he can perfectly work anywhere. But yet he chooses to work and then be a salesman because guess what? The money is good. You know, he can make six figures very easily, especially if you know your way around and how to work. So in that particular sense, I can see that it's, it's, it can work both ways. You know, you can have the experience for that type of position or you cannot have it. I mean, the education or, or have it at all, you know. So it is important to that sense. But I will tell you that if you're going to work for one of my business offices, you need to have some, you know, education in terms of accounting or you're going to be the director of our finance department, any of the finance departments, you need to have some level of education. Uh, but there are some uh, other positions that are entry-level positions where you do not have to have, per se, a, a degree or a higher standard of education. But in this sense, I will, you know, agree with uh, Yesenia that even for those positions, you should have some level of education in this particular time that, you know, all of, our, all of you are sharing that to complete an application, you need to have some access to a website a computer, a, a, a smartphone, or a tablet. So some level of education it is important. Now we can move to the second part of this question, which is the, uh, the technical uh, part of, of, of uh, education, the technical education. Uh, we do have several positions and probably at least half of our positions, we can count two or 300 employees are service technicians, you know, and these technicians, uh, once again, we go back to the same thing. Cars are not mechanical anymore. You know, cars are work with computers and computer chips. And uh, you do not have to necessarily go under a vehicle to inspect it and know what's wrong with it. You just connect two cables to a computer and those cables are connected to the, com to the uh, your, your vehicle computer. and in 20 seconds, it tells you what's wrong with a car just by that, because everything registers in the, car, in the car's computer. If we move into electronic vehicles, it's even more complicated because now everything drive, you know, moves and starts and every single function in your car uh, is driven through a computer. So in that sense, I think it goes back to the basic. We have learned through this pandemic that everything is going to be moving in a more technical way, in a more computer, uh, uh, you know, moving kind of, uh, I don't know. I do see, and I feel sorry for those, some of those entry level employees that we have, that they really struggle. And you probably have the same issues, like for example, when you go through your uh, benefits, uh, uh, you know, uh, times, you know, when you have your open, enrollments, you really have to help some of our people uh, to go through that because they really struggle. <laughs> they struggle to 
complete an application or even to know what they really want to do. So in that particular sense, uh, you do need to, to, to improve those uh, skills and those uh, uh, you know, traits that you can only do it if you are, you know, have some sort of a technical computer uh, education or at least some sort of instructions. I mean, I know it's not necessarily the education, the formal education, but you do need to have that particular knowledge, at least the basics. Uh, again, it's a very, uh, you know, not necessarily straight answer to that question, but I think it all depends on the industry and all depends on the uh, level. But yeah, education is obviously necessary at every level uh, of our industry. But at the same time, uh, everything it looks at least at this point is pointing towards having some degree of uh, computer education, some sort of uh, uh, technical education that is at least coming back and, you know, through the rest of the, uh, you know, panel uh, discussion, I think we'll probably see this being uh, uh, also touched by the rest of the panelists, I assume. Hope that answers it. Thank you, Jaime. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do work in a manufacturing facility myself, so definitely I do see uh, the necessity for employees to under understand computers, be able to basics. Uh, let me let me move a little bit into the interviewing process and find out a little bit about that. So, Roxana, uh, do you test candidates on skill sets, uh, soft skills, personality testing, anything like that? Where do you see that trend moving to? Yeah, um, actually, today, 82% of companies use some type of form of pre-employment assessment tests. Um, we're actually in our, for a company, we do the majority of our customers are asking, even for general labor, entry-level positions, they're asking to somehow be tested for, uh, from entry-level positions like warehouse, sometimes they ask for the math test skills, um, personality assessment tests. So yes, uh, we are, and I see the this is now the new trend for many, many companies and organizations that they wanna get, um, the employees are asking for these applicants to take this skill assessment test. Um, mainly to narrow down uh, their list of candidates who are invited for the job interview and, 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 and avoid the bias and make sure that they get facts based on the results um, on, on those tests. So it's always highly recommend to, if they're gonna be going in an interview or, or they're gonna be trying to be promoted to really understand the job functions and what they're getting into in their career or the job that they're gonna apply and prepare themselves before those tests. Because sometimes people think, oh, I have 20 years of experience doing that, but they don't prepare when it comes to those basic skill tests that at one point companies are taking in consideration. Good. Uh, Perla, what about new capabilities when you're interviewing things like Teams and Zoom and people using cameras on their cell phones, how, how has it impacted your interviewing techniques? Uh, what has been the impact in all recruiting aspects now that they have that capability? You're a mute, Perla. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't find my mouse. Yes, yeah, so for, um, just like everybody mentioned, right? Uh, the techniques for the recruiting aspect, um, depending on the, the caliber of candidates that we're hiring in for us, uh, primarily is uh, blue collar, as I mentioned earlier. So COVID didn't help, right? Uh, so most of our applicants don't have Wi-Fi's, they, they don't have laptops uh, with reliable webcams at their disposal, um, or they're not technological savvy. Um, and so navigating through the interview software or process has become very, very challenging. So we do resource to utilizing uh, phone communication, uh, text messages, um, again, in-person um, 
uh, uh, employees that come or candidates that come through walk-ins uh, through the iPad. So that's what um, that's what we're doing, and that's how it has impacted our, our recruiting process. Very good. Jessica, aside from the technology, how does the process of interviewing candidates have changed in your organization? And do you still conduct traditional interviews or behavioral interviews? Sure, so in our case, it is important for candidates to see firsthand what our environment is like. Uh, most people are not used to an industrial environment. So in addition to the traditional interview process, uh, which includes the phone screen with the HR representative and an in-person interview with a hiring manager, uh, we have included a plan tour which provides a visual understanding of our environment. This allows uh, the candidate to see where they would be working. In terms of the interview process, we do ask questions that helps us understand if the candidate's goals and desires match our offerings and expectations. Then we look for tendencies and examples of past experiences in both uh, work ethic and behaviors that match um, the set of values that the company uh, has, right? So things like courtesy, camaraderie, personal accountability, teamwork, and the desire to learn and grow amongst others. Very good. Yesenia, what about you? What, what can any of you do today to stand out and ensure that the best is shown during the interview process? I'm so glad I was asked this question because I deal with this a lot and it <laughs> irritates me when candidates are not prepared. And all of my interviews are via Zoom because I interview for my clients. And um, first of all, start off with proofreading your resume, please. Typos, make sure you don't have typos on there. Be consistent, look at the dates. Like I said, I get irritated when people aren't paying attention to their resume. But let's say they make it to the interview. Uh, people need to remember that even though it's a Zoom interview, it is an interview and you need to look presentable. I don't know how many times I've come across people and uh, they're not dressed appropriately, their hair is not done. They have the dog by the side, you know, diff, be prepared. You need to be mentally and physically prepared for this interview. You're, it's an impression and it's an impression of me. If you don't pass me, you don't make it over to the company. So it's very, very serious. Uh, visit the website if you can of that company so you can be familiar with the company. Ask questions. I love it when someone is prepared and they ask questions. Uh, that shows me that that candidate is interested in the position or the company. And then after the interview, make sure you follow up, send a thank you email, you know, uh, that, that way you stand out. Those people stand out to me because we have so many people we interview. And if you're sending me a thank you email or thank you text, I'll remember you. So those are some tips that I can give candidates uh, with interviewing. Very good. Should I read a question? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, we had a question come through. Are we holding questions to the end? Or do you want to just go ahead and just put, put them in now? Whatever you guys want. I think we can, we only have a, a few more questions and then maybe we can go and end. answer the question. Okay, wonderful. Thank um, you. So Jaime, yes. So Jaime, what would be three musts that a candidate needs to demonstrate in the interview process? that will make an impact on your decision. I know Yesenia touched base on a couple of things that she thought that were very important during that interview. Is there anything else that you can think of, additional things that are a must for you during the interview process? Oh, you're on mute, Jaime. I will speak for what we do in, in, in our industry. And uh, I wish we'd, we had stopped working at some point. We actually never went virtual because we were an essential part of uh, an essential business. You know, we still had to uh, sell cars to doctors and, and people who were also essential workers. You know, we had, still had to go there and fix their vehicles and fix their cars. So we never got to close uh, during this pandemic. And uh, saying that, I'm going to move into like, you know, yes, you have to show up and talk to someone and uh, not having, not, we never necessarily did any, Zoom interviews, you know, perhaps for a couple of management positions we did, but everybody still had to come and, and, and see a manager or talk to me or somebody else at a hiring level, one of those hiring managers. And something that we, being in our business, being the retail and the service business, to some point, uh, we are a little different. And one of the things that all the managers that we have 
we have no control of all the hundreds of customers we serve on a daily basis. You know, some of our dealerships have like two, three, four hundred customers or ROs, repair orders, what we call them on a daily basis. But Fridays, Saturdays, for example, some of our dealerships have hundreds of customers. So one of the essential things that I tell the guys and that the managers have done with is how important, and we heard this earlier, remember that we have no control of time. So there's no su su such thing as managing time. Remember that well, we heard that earlier today. So that is a key thing to me personally and to some of my managers, most of the managers, I will say, for you to show up on time of that interview. You know, why? Because that shows me not only how important this job is going to be for you, but it's also, but it will also show me the fact that you will be able to deliver that car on time when you promise a customer that a car is going to be ready at a certain time. Or if your customer is coming for a, uh, to see a car at a certain time and the customer will probably get upset and, you know, and won't feel easy, you know, it won't be easy that sale. I mean, that is just, uh, you know, for, to some people in some of the industries, a formality, you know, I have friends who work for Google and Apple and, you know, they certainly don't have that, you know, those are very creative jobs and they don't have a schedule. They can go at any point, at any time during the day, they can go at night, but not in our industry. You know, you need to be there on time. Showing up to you that interview, the first impression that you cause, walking that, if you walk in there, and a lot of times I've done this, you know, if you there, and it's 15 minutes after the fact, at the time you were supposed to show up, I probably would not talk to that person. You know, I probably said like, you know what, we probably reschedule it, but really you will not reschedule it. And uh, some of you will agree with me. So that is, along with the way you present yourself and that attitude that you will have towards that job, it, that will be my number one thing in terms of looking for an employee or an applicant. You know, you show up on time, you look decent, you don't smell, hopefully. And, uh, you know, have uh, <laughs> that attitude, that right attitude as of that day. You know, you show up on time, you have the right attitude. That is a plus to me, you know, and probably to most of the managers. Being in the retail industry, that is going to be very important. Uh, the second time will be more in the actual body of that interview. Once in the middle of that interview, the, um, the applicant should be able to show me, to demonstrate to me how their experience and skills uh, will benefit my company. You know, what have you done there before? You know, in, in our industry is very competitive. If you, if I see on your resume or you share with me that you work for Longo Toyota, who's a straight competitor with me, that will, you know, help, you know, lead me into asking questions about that job. And knowing that he's worked there, you know, I would probably be very, very interested on knowing, first of all, why do you leave that job? Because you know that's a great company to work for, why you want to come here. Uh, so if you're able to, through that interview to show me that your experience that I see on paper, and obviously through some other questions, that experience and those skills that you have will help me in my company, that will be probably my second uh, must to have. And the third thing, and this all is obviously one of the very important things in, in our uh, industry, we work in teams at every single department. Doesn't matter where you're going to work in teams. You work in teams in the service department, you're the yellow team, you work with that team. And if you are in the sales department, you're in the you know, B team, and that's your team, and you have your manager with that team. So you have to make sure that you are have that ability to work in teams. Team working, and, 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 and that is a key thing and uh, major companies up in the Silicon Valley work the same way. You know, you work in teams. Being able to show me that you are a team player and that you're able to work in teams is probably my third most important thing. There are tons of, I mean, it was very tough, you know, trying to, to put these into three main uh, uh, must-haves, you know, for an applicant. But to me, those are the three most important ones, at least in my industry, and that's what I've been uh, showing and teaching and training my managers. And I think we've done pretty well. 
Thank you, Jaime. Uh, I, you know, I, I hear every one of you when we talk about uh, interviewing, you know, I always say to people, it, it has never changed. You know, the process in which we interview people, you know, the conduit of which we use, right? Zoom, Teams, or whatever it may be, it's evolving, it's changing, it's absorbing the technology. But at the same time, I think that uh, depending on the industry, we're still utilizing you, the, the typical, you know, come to see me, come sit down with me, I need to see you in person, I need to talk to you, uh, have that meeting with me. Um, but I think also is go back to the basics, right? If I could advise people, I would say go back to the basics. The questions are still the same. The expectation pretty much is still the same. You know, everybody touch base on a little bit presentation, um, the way you project yourself, uh, you know, your tone of voice, your experience has to be able to flow in the interview process. And I think that's what I heard from all of you in in your respective you know uh industries and experience um but that would be one as well that i would say go back to the basics we have not changed the expectation interview process even though we're just using different technology to to do that right um let's move a little bit into um our resources here. So uh, today in our conference, we have representatives from schools, county offices, the veterans, EDD, Department of Rehab, American Job Center, Workforce Development, Goodwill Industries, etc. A lot of entities. What can you tell me, Yesenia? What can you tell me, uh, tell them actually to, to the best, uh, how to best prepare the job seekers? What would be the one thing that you can provide them uh, to help them uh, prepare these, uh, you know, students that want to go into the workforce? Right. Well, like you said, uh, Jaime touched on that. Uh, I did a sum on before uh, being prepared for the interview, but teach them how to use Zoom. Teach them how to use Zoom, how to prepare for it the day before. Like I said, we have a three-step process. I have someone screening the resumes via phone. She's talking to the candidates. They pass her, they come to me. It's all via Zoom. That's how I interview candidates. If they make it through me, they go to the client. Uh, some of these people are late, uh, which again, I, I connected with Jaime on that one. If, if they're, you know, I understand we have difficulties at first. Five minutes, I'm okay with it. 10 minutes, it's okay. But once you get to 15 and more, I'm not. Teach them how to use these sites, Zoom or whatever other sites are out there. Zoom is the most common one. What I recommend is uh, these candidates should be logging in the day before, at least practicing. So by the time they have the interview with me, they're ready to go. I can understand technical difficulties. Um, that's that, that would be my biggest recommendation. Teach them how to use these um, different uh, resources uh, so that they're ready technically to interview because a lot of us are going that route. You know, we still do the in-person, but I think like in my case, I interview everyone via Zoom before they make it over to the company. And if I can just uh, uh, elaborate on this a little bit more, teach these candidates about not only is it the interviewing process, but also when you start a job, work ethics. What does that mean? Be there on time, be there every day, work, don't be lazy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we're dealing with all that too with <laughs> candidates, uh, with employees. So I just had to throw that in there because it's what? a big deal. <laughs> We get paid for work, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Roxana, do you have anything to add to that suggestion? Oh my gosh, I can agree more with Yesenia. Definitely prepare them before the interview. Um, and to just not repeat the same thing that Yesenia mentioned, because it's the same thing that I have on my, on my mind, the background. When they're in the interview of those virtual interviews, sometimes applicants don't realize that they, they don't have a background. They should prepare themselves with a background. Um, sometimes we see rooms, we see closets, we see too many things that we should not see. <laughs> and that's something that they need to re be ready. It's like when you're getting ready, you put in your nice suit, clean cut, and you go for your interview, same thing. You have to see your surroundings. You have to prepare yourself to make sure you have the volume, um, that you're on mute, that you cover your background, that, that, that you look, you know, look presentable and clean. Um, also, um, 
I don't know, but it's very important that we coach our, our applicants on they're submitting resumes, and at least in our case and many other organizations, we use um, applicant tracking uh, uh, softwares, right? So prior of even getting to the recruiter or getting to the interview, they send resumes and many times, like let's say Indeed or SuperCuting, they have, let's say, men, um, machine operator, machine operator, machine operator, and all the applicants click on all these positions and they send one resume to all these companies take the time to review the job description of each company, take the time to update your resume based on that particular job that you're applying for. Sometimes we don't even, doesn't even get to us because the applicant tracking system doesn't even recognize your resume for what you're applying, even though it's the same job that you have done for many years. So really take the time to review each job description when you're applying for those jobs. Um, um, yeah, it, it, it's, um, but I don't want to repeat again what Yesenia said, but she mentioned very, really good things about, you know, be, be, uh, be on time, be professional. Um, you still, even if it's a Zoom, because everybody's using the Zoom for free up for free um, face to face interviews, prepare yourself for that. Um, train them, practice on how to interview. Some employees have been in a job for many years. And they're completely not prepared for presenting themselves on an interview. Um, so if they can set up the time to practice or they can have those classes where we can practice interviews and be free and open to say how we're gonna say, that's a big reliever for that, um, that interview. And the nervous go away. Like you can use sometimes because you're nervous, you say things that you're not supposed to be saying. And that can be a turn, um, turn off for the, for the interviewer. So prepare yourself for interview prior. That would be definitely my higher suggestion. Very good, thank you for that. Yeah, definitely preparing is a big one for us, um, having the person come in. Um, the other suggestion that I'll, I'll put my 10 cents on, into this as well. I, I think that a lot of the times what, I, what we look for in a resume is not a description of what they did, but what achievements they, accomplish in that job, because that will tell me the type of employee there were. A lot of the times what they do is they copy and paste the job description, right? This is what a customer service is supposed to be doing. So this is what I did, but it's so generic that doesn't uh, allow the person to stand out from other people. So I get the same generic information. Uh, my, my example is the customer service and I have 10 or 20 different people applying for the job and they have that generic explanation of what they did. So they will not stand out from anybody because they all have the same one. So my suggestion also would be to make sure that they include something that, uh, that some achievement, some goal, some special thing that they did that really, you know, brought that, uh, you know, job accomplishment or something where they really stood out. And that's going to catch the person's eye. The hiring manager will be like, oh, this is per this person is different because they did something, something outstanding or something different than everybody else uh, as well. Um, let me move to Jaime. So Jaime, um, what are your thoughts in, in order to partner with the different entities that we have today in uh, in our conference? What are the things that they could they can um, you know what, what can how can we partner with they, they can partner with the employers? What are the things that they can do? Just going back to the previous two questions, I will add you know just to make sure that and, and you might agree with me, you have probably seen these all over the place. Uh, those resumes, those applications, you know, just make sure you have a professional you know looking at least uh, email uh, address you know i've seen crazy things in terms of their actual email addresses i mean i said like uh, sexy chica for you at gmail.com you know don't put that <laughs> on your resume i've seen that and i still see it it's just crazy but i understand you probably have this email for a long long time but i think for a resume or application uh, you should have a professional uh, email address. I mean, that is a big thing. You know, but again, you know, not, I'm just saying, just throwing it out there, food for thought. Uh, now, uh, historically, I think we, we have, uh, our company has partnered with a lot of these institutions. We have partnered through the years with the Mount San Antonio College and Rio Hondo College and their uh, auto programs. 
with Hacienda La Puente uh, School District uh, as well, we have in their uh, automotive uh, uh, educational uh, area that they have here locally, the adult uh, school, a, a very good one that we were having right before COVID hit was with the uh, Los Angeles uh, Unified School District. And they had a very good program actually starting in high schools. And why I mentioned this is because uh, a lot of kids, and you know this, we have a lot of kids out there with, with, with uh, you know, university and four years, school, you know, school degrees that are not doing anything out there. You know, we somehow were pushing this a lot a few years ago, and, 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 and these kids are working, doing all kinds of stuff like delivering food and, you know, or, or, or driving for Uber or Lyft. Uh, and we uh, honestly did not uh, support enough this uh, trade and technical education. That is a big thing right now, being in the uh, car industry, in the auto industry that we have not seen, but at least it's looking that it's changing a little. Uh, so we were partnering with the uh, LA Unified School District in this program because this should start early. This should start in high school. You know, making sure these people, these kids get these ideas that, you know what, you don't really need to, it's not for everyone. You don't really need to have a first you know, year degree and go to a university to make good money. We have technicians, car, auto technicians who make six figures easily, you know, and we provide all the education once you are in, you know, you have Toyota University or, or BMW University. I mean, these are things that are happened and, and paid by the manufacturers for you to become a master technician, an A-class technician. And this can provide you, I mean, good income for life. I mean, it's just, we're talking about, and all these companies provide good benefits. You know, you, you have a good match on your 401k, but you don't necessarily, it's not for everyone, as I said, you do not necessarily have to go take those, you know, four years of college when you can actually go and start since, as I said, since high school, we have this with the LAUSD uh, intern, internship, you know, car technician uh, positions, you know, and you start since you are like 16 or so, you have to work your, you know, everything with it in terms of the liabilities and workers comp and all that. But uh, some of those kids we have already, that once you turn 18, they're yours and they start working you as a loop technician and they move up. And we have at least two or three very successful stories there that, you know, these kids are already 21, 22, and they're master technicians. And they're making, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a year. And, you know, just how the things are right now. Of course, they're young and they, they know their cell phones and their technology and, and, and they're good. It's easier for them to learn all these new changes that are coming with the hybrids and the electro, sorry, the electronic cars. So... Yes, we have partnered with them. need to interrupt, sorry. Honey, yeah. thanks. Me. We have six, I think yeah. we have six questions in chat. We have yeah, less we Thank you. So thanks for great answers. So maybe if you can answer these questions like in 30 seconds or less. Oh, goodness. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jaime. I appreciate it. I only have two more questions and we're done. So the next question is for Jessica. Um, I went uh, with the growing cha challenges in the drug and background testing or checking, as part of the hiring process, do you foresee any changes in companies' requirements? Sure, so uh, um, those can certainly be challenges. Uh, I can tell that we have adopted practices in line with legal requirements, such as that in the box and the like. Uh, requirements for position vary, and there are some where there might be some flexibility depending on the job. However, the safety and well-being of our employees is a priority, and it takes precedence over the ease of filling a position. Uh, many of our positions are considered uh, safety sensitive and require full attention and awareness. Any impairment uh, may be catastrophic results, and that's a risk that we are not willing to take. Uh, perhaps as technology uh, improves or changes to differentiate when someone is actively under the influence, uh, such as marijuana, versus when the THC is simply uh, still lingering in their system based on prior consumption, we may consider adopting different practices Meanwhile, we continue to focus on safety and compliance. Very good. Yeah, I think a lot of the companies continue to test for marijuana as well. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of, I think, compliance and like you mentioned, safety issues that, that will be a concern. Uh, Perla, telework has erupted and has challenged, changed the dynamic for the most workplaces. 
and how businesses are run. How has your industry been impacted and how placement entities can help with the new culture? So telework has hindered us from allowing us to create and solidify, I would say, our company culture. You know, most of our jobs are required to, to be here um, at the work because this is where our employees are, right? But we do have employees who are remote, partial remote, and also 100% remote. And with those, I see the challenges of, you know, for example, meetings, um, team engagement activities uh, with some of the employees that are exclusively working from home, um, you know, it, it's become a hindrance for us. So, um, you know, remote working isn't really conducive to creating meaningful relationships, you know, so um, the same as if they were here in the office. So events when we used to do, you know, uh, employee events or, you know, picnics or, or yearly anniversary events um, have also become a challenge for us because one of COVID and two, because of our employees that are working remote, sometimes they feel that, you know, they're isolated or, uh, there's things going on via email that I'm like, well, what happened? No, that wasn't the case. Or sometimes, honestly, it, it does, you know, we send out an email, put up our postings, and, and then we hear a remote employee, wait, I wasn't included. Or when COVID happened, you know, we were going in the process of, um, you know, disinfecting the location and then here they are, employees working remote. And so, you know, just the communication, the ability to adapt to, to the ever-changing, obviously, climate situation and the recruitment challenges. Um, and then now the remote even has hindered us uh, from possibly hiring some employees in our clerical roles because that's the first thing they asked you know, is, is remote work available? And it's not, you know, a lot of the, the positions, yes, we can do it for our accounting roles, but it's not ideally 100% that we encourage it. We do encourage them to come to the office at least twice a week, uh, three times a week, and maybe one day uh, work remote. Yeah, I think it's very important to to the uh, job seekers to understand that not always we can do the remote and it's going to take some time to kind of retrain everybody to believe that, okay, it is mandatory to go back to work and the offices. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I know we're opening for questions. We have several questions in very little time. So Jackie, can you help us with the questions, please? Yes, we have just um, about four minutes, so we want to stay on schedule. Um, so some of the questions you guys did answer um, during the session, but I am going to pick one that I think is a good question that came in about assessments. And I believe Roxana may have touched on that just a little bit, but it's open to anyone. Um, can you, can anyone describe just more in details as it relates to assessments that employers are given? What exactly are they looking for when they do these assessments? I can tell you one of the ones that we use here is called the AVA uh, analysis. And it's a three three question assessment where it asks us to or ask the candidate to tell us about how do they perceive others to perceive them, how do they perceive themselves in the job that they're in, and how how would they describe themselves. And this report tells us about their natural tendencies of an individual, and it compares them to how other people perceive them, how they may be perceived the natural tendencies with the job that they're performing. Uh, so, for example, if someone's an introvert and they're working in sales. Um, it doesn't mean that they can't do sales. It just means that they're in, in uh, conflict with the natural tendencies. And lastly, it kind of gives us an idea as to uh, how they, what the natural tendencies are that they may or may not be aware of and that they may or may not disclose during the, the interview process. This uh, is not necessarily a qualifying um, activity, but it gives us an idea of what kinds of questions we should ask to get, get to know the candidate a little bit better. Okay, awesome, awesome. I think we have time for one more. So what do you feel is the best online tool to help students identify a short list of careers that might appeal to them? Does anyone want to answer that? I put California Career Zone in the chat. Okay, I just saw that, yeah. Okay. I see another answer coming through. Okay, we have about one more minute. Um, 
Yeah, so one question that came in real quick. Uh, what is your advice for someone with intellectual disabilities? If I may, I would encourage them not to self-disqualify. Uh, part of the requirements, not only of the state, but the countries to, for us to accommodate uh, some of the um, um, restrictions that they may have. I would say encourage them to, to apply or get to know the, the hiring manager and what are the essential functions of any job and, and have them gauge whether they, they can perform the work or not. But definitely not self-disqualifying. So like one of the earlier per, per, um, presenters were saying, uh, kind of cut out some of the negative self-talk. Great, awesome, awesome. Well, it looks like we're gonna run out of time. We have about 30 seconds. I just wanted to make a comment in regards to the resume and Roxana mentioned the ATS system. Um, the font's very important when you guys are having your clients do resumes. You want to make sure that it reaches the very end of the system. So using your basic fonts, I know that Cheryl talked about basic fonts like Times Woman. Um, Times Woman is, is very basic. Ariel's another one that's very basic so that it will get through the applicant tracking system and reach the recruiter. And secondly, your students need to know about elevator pitch. That's going to be the main thing to sell that person doing an interview. In the first 30 seconds, they have to know their elevator pitch. And I think we have two seconds. I want to thank the, the panel for sharing some great information. And also um, there's gonna be the evaluation. If you guys can take time to get that done, we'd really appreciate it. Sho, do you wanna go ahead and end it with any comments? Um, no, I just, wanna, I just wanna thank my colleagues uh, uh, for participating and for giving us insights on you know their practices and their interview techniques and just an overall look at what HR does when we're trying to find candidates out there. So thank you very much for your participation. And obviously on behalf of the CPA, we thank you for participating. So next year we will be March 1st through the 3rd, 2023 at the Double Tree Hilton at the Golf Resort in Palm Springs. We look forward to seeing you there. Think about it, save the date, start mentioning it. Um, and plan it on your fiscal budget for next year so that we can see you live and in person. 